for um, another conversation on hope. I'm here with my beautiful friend Mindy and we are going to be talking about a struggle that began for her quite a number of years ago. Um, she's She was expecting her third son eight years ago and had two little boys at home, healthy little boys, three and six, and with all the anticipation of a new third little baby boy on his way, um, you got some pretty sobering news from the doctors in the medical field. So tell me what they found, how they fa found it, and a little bit about that diagnosis as you were pregnant. Sure. Um, well, we went in just like every couple does, um, our regular prenatal visits, and it was our 20-week ultrasound. And um, where you find out if it's a boy or a girl, and at least that's what you think you're finding out. The doctors are looking at a myriad of other things. Yeah. Um, but, um, you know, laid down on the table, the sonographer was doing her work. My husband and my oldest son were there. Um, he's a mature little six-year-old, and um, we thought it would be fun for him to be there to find out with us, you know, whether he was getting a little brother or a little sister. And so um, she was going through doing all of the checking and um, told us that it was a little boy and we were really excited and, you know, big brother was excited for another little brother. Um, and then she just got really quiet. And, um, you know, I had been through that experience twice before. I kind of knew how long that took. And I finally just said to her, I said, I know you can't tell me what's wrong, but mm -hmm. can you tell me what you're looking at? And she just said, it's his heart. And so um, at that point, your stomach drops out. And I just looked at my husband and I said, you need to take Ty home. Okay. So um, she told us you need you to go upstairs to talk to your doctor. And so I grabbed all the paperwork and you're in a fog and we went upstairs. And my doctor said, I can only tell you two things. I'm not your doctor anymore and you will not be delivering your baby at this hospital. So that's and what we knew. And then what? Like, how did that sink in, or did it even sink in? What you were, you weren't really being told anything at that point. No, nothing, because he, he wasn't the one to make the diagnosis for the baby, oh, just, okay. just that something was wrong. Um, and so I left, my husband had come back to get me, dropped off my son, had come back to get me, and I left, and I just remember kind of stumbling out of the office and looking at him, and I said, I don't, what are we supposed to do? We've got the name of this doctor, who they tell us can't see us for two weeks, and um, uh, my husband just said to me, You're, you can get your file. Do you want your file? It's your file. So I think it was the one thing that he could do. So he said, you wait here. I'm going to go back and we're going to get copies of what the reports from today. So he grabbed them and um, we went home and did the worst thing we could have possibly done, which was start Googling everything that was on that paper. And we just knew it was bad. So um, he was eventually diagnosed as having a single ventricle heart. Um, with um, pulmonary atresia, which means that he only had two chambers of the four chambers that a heart typically develops, and he didn't have any connection to his lungs, which meant in utero he was fine. The way that the blood flows between a mother and a baby, he was fine. Um, but when a baby's born, that switches direction, and they have to they have to maintain those systems on their own. And he had no no pathways to do that. So um, we began visits with a high-risk obstetrician and with cardiologists and with surgeons and wow. developed a plan um, for this baby. So what were they telling you though? So y y you would deliver and then he'd be rushed off to, would he be on medications or would it be a surgery that he'd have to go through right away? Or what were you being told once it so was diagnosed? We were told that he would need to be delivered in a high risk um, delivery room, which meant that I wouldn't be able to see him or hold him. They would take him immediately away. Right. And it, it was just like that. I mean, it was right through this little, I call it a fast food window, like straight from me to the, through this window to the doctors and um, they just started working on him. So he was immediately ventilated and he was in surgery when he was less than a day old to try and create And that did you space. know they were going to have to do surgery yes. as soon as yeah, he was Yeah, they knew, so definitely. Same. They had to, they, the most pressing problem was to compensate for that lack of connection between the heart and the lungs. Okay. So the, the first surgery they needed to sew, sew a Gore-Tex tube that functioned for that missing artery between his heart and his lungs. So. Oh, wow. Yeah. At one day old, two days old. Yeah. And he was in ICU mm -hmm. for quite a while. Mm -hmm. So you go home. You get, or back and forth between the hospital, and is it is it one surgery or is it multiple surgeries or kind of take us through the first maybe the first six months to a year of 
little McKay's life. Sure, sure. Yeah. So his name is McKay. Oh, yeah. So we can call him McKay. Okay. Um, he did as well as could have been expected. We had some bumpy nights and some scary days um, in the hospital, but all in all, he only spent about two weeks that um, the first two weeks of his life there. And we're so lucky to live in a valley with yeah. such amazing medical care. So we really were in the best hands. Um, so we brought him home and he just started growing. And these heart babies, they don't do that. I mean, they wow. they rarely eat, they don't thrive. And But McKay was just chunky and gaining weight, and which was all great, except for that it meant a week after we got him home, he needed to be taken back because he was so blue. He needed oxygen support and oh. um, a surgery that may have been at six months to a year for another child, um, ended up being at three months for him. Oh, so wow. um, we went back in November and spent his first Thanksgiving getting his second open heart surgery. So second open heart surgery within the first year of his life. What, what, are, you, what are you hoping for at this point? I mean, is it that the next surgery will solve the problem or did you know it was going to be long term? So. Um, we knew he was never going to be fixed. Like, there's okay. not a way to reconstruct the heart. So what we were trying to do was sort of bypass the body's normal systems to create a new plumbing system for him where his blood could be oxygenated and he could live as normal a life as possible. Um, you know, probably never tackle football, probably never, but those right. are things that, those were dreams that were easy to let go of um, for him. And I think my hope at that point was just to make it through the plan. You know, the doctors were very much giving us windows of time. Well, between this age and this age, he'll need this. And between this age and this age, he'll need this. And he was always beating all of their expectations. He was oh, on wow. less medication than they, and they always said. And so we really felt very lucky, very blessed. Um, we, we came to a, a night that I, I will never forget because we were at a benefit for heart children. Um, and a local, well, he's really, internationally known, Paul Cardall was doing a benefit for these heart kids. And um, he dedicated one of the songs to McKay's surgeon. And I didn't know why he did that. And so I started asking around and M McKay's surgeon had been diagnosed with cancer and oh. had walked out of the hospital. And so um, honestly, I had my first panic attack at that point because this was the man who had saved my child's life. And he, McKay oh. still needed one more surgery. And so I remember thinking, I remember going home and telling my husband, I'm just going to drive to his house like he just has to do one more. He just, doesn't he want to do one more? He's got to save him. He's the only one that knows the ins and out of his anatomy. He told us how specialized it was and what a privilege it was to work on him because it was such a challenging case. And how is he going to tell anybody? Like, he just left. You can't just leave. You can't just leave. And so um, that, that really jolted us back into reality of how much faith we had put into this man and his skills and his gift as a surgeon. And then we were just tossed into this unknowing, mm -hmm. like that wasn't part of the plan. You know, we were working the plan. Uh, so we ended up doing a, na a nationwide search for the best surgeon um, for McKay. And it ended up that we took him for his third surgery right before he turned two to um, Philadelphia and just had access to an amazing medical team there. And it ended up being one of the hardest and best decisions though that we could have made for him. There's wow. a lot of good that came from that visit. Wow. So you worked the plan. The plan got changed at the very midnight hour, right? unexpectedly. Um, let's fast forward now. It's been eight. He's eight. He just turned eight, right? Right. And he's doing, he has good days, bad days. He's doing well. He's still exceeding expectations, tell us. Now at the age of eight, how little McKay is doing. So um, the heart issues have really taken a back burner for us um, okay. over the, the intermediate years. So when we got him home after his third surgery, um, we took him into his pediatrician for the regular checkups after he turned two. And he said, okay, we know he's gonna survive. It's time to help him thrive. Oh. It's time to get occupational health therapy, speech therapy, he wasn't speaking. You know, we thought that all of that had to do with him being in the hospital so much and oxygenation sure. issues and, you know, there's just nobody was pushing for sort of developmental milestones at that point. Um, so we, we got him home and I had all the therapists coming into the house, parading in and out and in and out. 
So that was in September, and by January, February, the therapists were looking at me like, there's, there's no progress here. Like, he's, wow. he's not making typical progress. We, we need okay. to try something else. So we started seeing some other specialists, and um, I had one speech therapist tell me, you really need to start getting him evaluated for developmental delays. So we had this, again, a plan, this list of doctors that we needed to help him um, start seeing. And we started to hear the word autism mm. come into the picture for us. Recurring theme. Yeah. And so I, oh, I was so angry. I was so very angry because, I mean, hadn't this child been through enough? You know, haven't we been through enough? Like, Now, at that point, when you say you were angry, who were you angry at? The doctors? The development? I, I doc think I was angry in general, and I was very angry with God. Like, what? What is this? What is this plan? Like we have learned our lesson. We're we're a tight little unit now. We've gone through our challenge. Um, I remember before having McKay talking to a friend and just saying, you know what? God can take whatever He wants from me. He can burn down my house. He can, you know, whatever whatever challenges He needs in the road for me. But He better not ever touch my kids. You know, and that just kept ringing in my ears again and again and again. He, he better not touch my kids. And, um, yeah, and so don't say stuff like that into the universe, I guess, is the answer to that. But um, you realize pretty quickly that they're not your kids, you know? They're not yours. They're his. Right. And so he had a plan for Mac, and I was just an instrument in that plan. And so as we, as we started to learn more about the why McKay acted the way he did, why he wasn't developing the way he did, why he didn't speak, why didn't he didn't look at people, why he was very methodical about the way he played and, and things like that. Everything started to make sense. I mean, we didn't know anything about the world of autism. We didn't know anyone. We had right. never seen it. Um, <coughs> but we just tried to learn as much as we could just with the heart condition. You know, you just try and pour in that knowledge and thinking there's got to be something that we can do to fix it. And if we can't fix it, we should at least know as much as we can about it. Right. Uh, but it started a whole different journey that was very different from uh, um, a medical condition that's looked upon with a lot of sympathy and support and um, infrastructure, if you will, of, you know, people that want to help and that are designed to help. Um, honestly, when McKay finally received like the diagnosis, we got a packet of information full of phone numbers and the, the psychologist said, good luck. And that and was plan it. B. That was the whole plan, was uh, good luck. So there's not, there's not a ton of support in that community, at least for, you know, this is what it's going to look like. This is what you're going to do next. This is the school he should go to. This is what it's going to look like when he's six, when he's seven. There's not, it's not as laid out as the heart condition was for us. And that was wow. really hard. Wow. So all the while, you've got two older sons. Sure. So how do you create structure for McKay and keep him developing and, and, you know, discovering and yet, you know, create some type of normalcy within your home for your other two children so they feel like they're having at least a good childhood and mm -hmm. experience growing up? Mm -hmm. how, how, do, how do you balance that as a mom? Do you know what? I think, um, I think every day is different. I think some days we do it really well and some days we really mess it up. Um, but I think, I think I don't start the day with a lot of expectations, really. I mean, the expectation is my kids are going to feel loved, and I'm going to make today as great as, poss as I can. But a lot of the other stuff is out of my hands. Mm -hmm. So um, we didn't patronize our kids or shield them at all, which I think was important. I think that was a good move. Um, okay. for us or you know something that we were inspired to do mm -hmm. um, because they're not going to understand this behavior that they see from their brother and the fact that we're not punishing him for exhibiting this behavior you know we we, we discipline him to a point but there's a point at which his understanding it wouldn't do any wouldn't good do any good yeah. and and so to see um, we've had a lot of discussions with our boys about fairness what's fair um, what, why, how we're all sent here to have different experiences. Um, and I've also tried to involve them instead of sort of shield them and send them away. Um, they have special gifts with him too. And so, you know, to say, you know what, he loves when you sing that song or could he please borrow that special book of yours? It always calms him down. 
you know, is it okay, if, mm -hmm. could you just share that track? And then, right. you know, just heaping the praise onto them for, for being willing to do that um, has been a way for us to not say, look, there's him and then there's you guys and mm -hmm. we're gonna keep that separate. Yeah. Um, they, they're a unit, like, we're a unit. We have to function as a team together. What a blessing that is for them as, as, you, as they grow and you send them off into the world to give them that foundation of compassion and understanding. So when they look at an, a child or a person or an adult who has a special need, that it's, it's you know, a wall doesn't go up mm -hmm. or they don't turn their face and not want to look. I mean, they will just embrace that because that's what you've taught them and that's what you've modeled for them. I, I hope think that's so. beautiful. Yeah, I really hope so. I do know that they look at things a little bit differently. Um, a lot of times we'll be in line somewhere and they'll, they'll be the first to spot another child like McKay and say, Mom, Mom, you know, Aww. there's a kid like Mac, you know, or, um, and I, I like that sensitivity. I think, I think that's kind of an invisible world for a lot of people. Sure. You see a child and you think, oh, they're misbehaving or gosh, they wish their parent would just get that under control or, you know, you want to get away as soon as possible because there's some kind of an unpleasant experience going on and um, they do they do want to help. They want to get yeah. in the middle of that. Yeah. So. so what what do you how how has your hope changed through the years after going through plan A, plan B being sent on your way saying, Hey, good luck. How how has your hope changed? That's a good question. Um I think hope is a funny thing. I um Hope is so much, to me, hope is, 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 is light, and it's a light that we have to cultivate. Um, and I really, I have to fill up on that light a lot more often, I think, and a lot more consciously sure. um, than I've had to do in the past. Um, but I would say previously with the heart condition, um, our hope was really in, in skills and in doctors and in plans and in medicine and, you know, we can work the plan, give me the plan. Um, you know, it's going to be hard, but we can get through it. We know what that looks like. We've seen kids that have come out of this. I've seen one adult, you know, that's in his 30s that, you know, I know that McKay can at least make it to that old. We've, so when mm -hmm. you've seen it, kind of your hope is in, in a goal, in a concrete thing that you've seen already. Right. Um, but with the autism, I don't, I, I can't see the end of that. I can't see the road for that. Um, I've said before that I felt like the heart condition was a, was a death sentence, but we, but we beat it, right? The plan beat it, he beat those odds. But autism feels like a life sentence. And sometimes that's harder. Oh yeah. It's harder to not know that there's, to know that there's not an end. There will never be an end to this for him. I had his kindergarten teacher tell me, you really should let him ride the bus into school because that's gonna be one of the life skills that we can develop for him. And I thought, riding the bus, like, that's going to be the highest level of skill that my child's going to develop is being able to ride the bus. And that sounds so proud and so rude, maybe. But, like, I, I've always dreamed a little bigger than teaching my kids to ride the bus. Right. You know what I mean? Like, their level of independence, I want it to be bigger than riding the bus. So that hit me really hard. Um, and I know now that, you know, when I get up in the morning, there isn't, there isn't always going to be a plan. And so my hope is in Christ. My hope is knowing that this is his spirit that he sent to me um, to caretake and to guide. And um, I've had some experiences with McKay. I remember one night um, feeling really hopeless, feeling really sad that I was inadequate to be the, his child's mother and just praying over him. He was asleep in his bed and just begging God to let me know what to do for him. And I just had this witness that we were spirits that were supposed to journey together. And it wasn't like a mother-child paternal relationship witness. It was a peer. It was somebody that I knew before this life and that we had made a covenant with each other that whatever our goal, whatever our journey was going to be, that we were going to help each other through it. And um, that helps me on more days than, it, than not to just say, you know what, I don't know why, why we're together, but I know that that's supposed to be. And I know that God blesses that. And whatever he joins, he's, he's going to watch over. Right. And so um, 
I put a lot of faith in Christ to just see us through. Sometimes it's hour to hour, um, but to just say, use me, use me, Lord. What does this child need today? What does his spirit need today? What do my other children need today? And just use me, please. Well, I think you are an amazing person, an amazing mother, and you have such a strong story and such a strong spirit. Um, I wish every mom could get there mm. because I think, I think for many of us, it's day to day and we put our hopes in things, stuff of the world, and we never come to the realization that the only hope we have is in Christ and we, we have to surrender to that and we have to trust and have faith and you've learned that lesson and you're living it and no, it's not easy. You. And I just thank you for sharing your story and for sharing McKay with us. I've never met McKay, but I've heard he's just a oh, bright, bright you light. have to come meet him. He would love you too. Thanks, thank Heidi. you so much for sharing your story, Mindy. Thanks. Okay.